Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Take your Bibles and open up to Romans chapter 3, if you would please. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. <clears throat> And verse 23. For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. From Adam until the end of time, the Bible proclaims that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, God demands punishment or penalty for sin. He always had in the Old Testament and he still does today. So something, someone has to pay the price, the penalty for that sin. What sin? Well, the sins of the world. The sins that Adam and Eve uh, uh, made and did. The sins that you and I do. And the sins that anyone that ever will be until the Lord comes back, that they do. That's the sins it's talking about. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin falls short of God's glory. In other words, in sin, we do not have the God of mercy. In sin, we do not have Jesus and his promises. In sin, we do not have eternal life with God. But there's a place called hell, like a fire, that has been prepared for those who are in sin. And we can praise God. We can praise God this morning that he made a way. He made a way to pay the price, the penalty for sin, to have it removed so that we can be reconciled back to him. Those of us that have repented of our sins because we have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and have been baptized by immersion to have our sins washed away, we are in the kingdom of God, the church. But I want to talk a little bit this morning about those who are not in Christ. We live in a world where there's literally millions and millions and millions of people who have, have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will not get their opportunity and privilege to be able to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. They won't be the ones who get to st uh, stand before the throne of God for all eternity and see all, all the majestic things that there is to see. But they'll be lost. They'll live in a place called hell, the lake of fire for all eternity, where there's, it's dark and there's smoke and it stinketh and the pain never goes away. There is not even the least es essence of God's love there. So we can thank God that there is a message that can be preached and taught to the one who has never become a Christian so that they can. They can decide, do I want to be a Christian or not? And I think what helps us decide whether we want to be a Christian or not is what happens to us when we die. When we leave this earth, you know, do we go to heaven? Do we go to be with the devil in, in the lake of fire? I think that helps us make the decision. But also, the Bible says, Jesus taught in John's account of the gospel that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he was signifying which death he should die. And when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, 1 through 4, the gospel is simply the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus dying on the cross, being buried in the tomb, and raising again the third day from the dead by the power of God never to die again. 
That's what Jesus said He would draw all men unto Him with. And so therefore, I believe also that the Bible teaches when a person hears the gospel and hears what Jesus did for them, it causes not only faith in their heart, but it causes a strong love for the one who died for them. It causes a strong enough love that they want to hold on to Him and His Word until the end or until Jesus comes back. You see, if we're able to hold on to Him and His Word until then, we'll get to hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. So it's important that we know what it is we're getting ourselves into and how to keep ourselves in it. Matthew chapter 1, the Bible says that Jesus came to save His people from their sins. Sins is what separates us from God. Excuse me. Sins is what causes us to miss heaven and causes us to have to go to hell, that lake of fire, and live for eternity. Sins. And that's why Jesus came back to save us from our sins. Jesus did a lot of things. <laughs> You see, He did miracles. He brought people back to life. He healed the sick. But His main purpose was to save us from our sins. How does He do that? Well, since He had already gone back to be with God, His Father in heaven, and He gave His uh, apostles, the twelve apostles, the commandment to write the Word of God. And they did. And since He completed His Word, we have the full will of God right now. And God speaks to us through His Word. And we get to talk back to Him or speak with Him, communicate with Him in prayer. That's good news in itself. And uh, <clears throat> we can study God's Word and God will instruct you and me. He'll educate us to make the proper decisions that will cause you, if you're not a Christian this morning, it will cause you, if you listen to what God says, it will cause you to make the right decisions that will cause God to forgive you of your sins and forget them, never to remember them again. And He, he goes as far as to say that you will become His child, His daughter, His son, and He will become your God personally. You belong to Him. That's what God will do. But you see, we have to do it the way the Bible teaches us. God instructs us. Man doesn't just doesn't do a very good job of that sometimes. You know, man sometimes, whether they know it or not, teach the message of the devil. You know, the devil's not going to show himself as he is. So he's got to do it in, in a little way so that he can deceive us little by little. He's got to make it sound good long enough until he traps us. And I'm telling you, there's a devil out there working to do that. And maybe you've, you've heard all kinds of ways. Maybe you've been confused by messages that preachers have uh, been preaching and teaching. And you don't know which way to turn, which one's right, what you should do. Maybe a person that has been taught by some preacher that God is love and He won't send no one to hell. And when you go uh, and assemble with other Christians and you hear the preacher preach and there's prayer made and things of that nature, maybe you just bundle all up inside like there's just all peaches and cream. Well, Satan can make it that way too. But God did one thing for us. He left us His complete written Word. You and I do not have to rely upon some preacher, some man, some woman to find the truth of God's Word. The, the Bible says that if we we'll obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you see, He took our place on the cross. God demand punishment for sin. And we could not pay for that, pay that penalty. We could not do what God wanted. It took His Son Jesus. His Son Jesus was willing to leave the splendors of heaven and come to this earth and die on an old rugged cross. He was willing to be crucified and slain 
Even John the baptizer called him the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. God has always used a sacrifice from the Old Testament to the New. The Old Testament high priest would use animal sacrifice, the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. But Jesus, Jesus was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He was the perfect sacrifice. Never have to do it again. And when we repent of our sins after hearing the gospel, when we turn away from our old ways of living, and we change our mind and conduct toward the way that we're living, and we turn towards God, and we're baptized by immersion, not sprinkling, not poured upon, that's nowhere found in the Bible. But immersion is being submerged completely under the water. It's a burial. We're buried with Christ in baptism. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, We're buried with Him. And then we rise to walk in newness of life. <clears throat> All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. We need to know what sin does. What the Bible says about it. Not what just what men say about it, but what the Bible says about it. What God thinks of sin. And in verse 23 of chapter 6, For the wages of sin is death. That's not talking about physical death, even though that could come about. It's talking about spiritual death. It's talking about the second death. Separated from God for all eternity. You see, when we're separated from God for all eternity, we never be able to physically, spiritually smell, see, hear anything of the essence of God's love ever again. That's what spiritual death is. That's what that's talking about. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even though we have sinned against God, and we have, God is still willing to give us the perfect gift, the best gift that He could ever give us. And that was His Son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And He did. I'm telling you, Jesus has already died on the cross over 2,000 years ago, and He has opened the door to the kingdom of God, not for just the Jews, but for every nationality, for every man and woman. He has opened the door up for them. It is open wide now. Every person, I don't care what anybody says, I don't care what the Jews say. I don't care what the black people say, the white people say, China, Russia, whoever. I don't care what they say. God says the door is open for every nationality, every person, every man and woman. You have the privilege and opportunity to come to the one who died for you, laid his life down for you this morning. If you're not a Christian, you have that opportunity. Today, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came to save us from our sins. When we're saved from our sins, we're saved from hell. When then we're in a saved condition. Now we've turned around from leading a life of going to hell to leading a life that will take us to heaven. You see? And so, that, that is a gift, isn't it? Yes, to be saved from hell is a gift given to us by God. If you'll take your Bibles and open up to Luke's account of the gospel, we just need to know a little bit about, about these places before we can make an educated decision whether we want to be there or not. You know, if we just said hell and heaven... That will leave a lot of gray area for us to wonder about. What is it like there? Luke 16, starting with verse 19. 
What we find written in the Word of God is all that we have to know of what heaven is like and what hell is like. Because no one except for Jesus himself has ever gone to either place and come back. Anybody else that dies and goes to either heaven or hell will never leave those places. They will never ever come back from them places. And in verse 16 or 19, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day or lived luxuriously. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man did not lift a finger to help the poor man Lazarus, neither by feeding him or taking care of the sores on his physical body. But he just let him die, living in his luxurious living, to the point where the beggar died. When the beggar died, it says that he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. He went to Hades, a part of Hades, which is called, and I forget the name of it, Tartarus, and, or Paradise, excuse me. And there, whether he got to enjoy the full splendors of heaven or just some of it, when the rich, when the, uh, Lazarus died, that's where he went, to Paradise, in Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried. And see, he died, and he was not carried by the angels, though, it doesn't say. But <clears throat> he went to a place in Hades, too, called Tartarus. It's a abode of the dead, those who did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who did not go to be in Abraham's bosom. And it says, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. You see, when we die, the body goes back to the dust from which it is created. But our spirit lives on for eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. The spirit of Lazarus the beggar lived in paradise. This before Jesus died. And is Abraham's bosom. The spirit of the rich man went to be in this place called hell. And he is able to lift up his eyes. He is able to open up his eyes and see. He can see. And he can see that he was in the flame of torment. And he see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Yes, the rich man went to a place that he'll never be able to escape. He'll never leave this place. And he is in torment, in flame and fire. And the only thing he could think about was, I need water, I need water. And he could see from heaven to hell, but Lazarus the beggar could not see from, excuse me, he could see from hell to heaven, but Lazarus the beggar could not see from heaven to hell. And so uh, the, the rich man looked up and seen Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and wanted Abraham to send him down to, with water on his finger and cool off his tongue. He was in that much agony. You see, we find what happens to us when we die. Our bodies go back to the dust from which it's created and our spirit goes somewhere to live for eternally, either in heaven or in hell. It was so bad there. The rich man had already died. His body had already been buried. His spirit had already gone to the place, its own place, because of his disobedience to God. Too late for him. He could not make any more decisions as he cannot escape that. But he did have five brothers who could. 
and said in verse 25, And Abraham... <clears throat> but, Ab <clears throat> but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, there's a transparent wall. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there or thence. Then he said, I pray thee, the rich man, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. You see, that man, that rich man that went to hell, did not want to see his five brothers anymore. Can you imagine saying that? Whether he had one or twenty, you didn't want to see them ever again. Well, in, in the physical sense, you'd say, what, did you, what is it? Do you hate your brother or what is it? But in the eyes of God, in the eyes of this rich man that went to hell, he loved his brothers so much that he didn't want them to come there. Because that would be the only way that they could see each other again. If they went to hell, he didn't want them there. He wanted someone to go and share the gospel with his five brothers so they wouldn't have to come to that dreadful place. Think about that rich man, the things he had just said. Would you and I want to be in that position where the rich man is? Would you and I want to, someone to just dip a little cold water on their finger and cool off the tip of our tongue? Would you and I want to never see our loved ones again because we're in hell? We will want them to come to that dreadful place. We know a little, little bit about hell. Not everything there is to know about it, but a little bit, enough to help, my, help us make an educated decision that we don't want to go there. There is a heaven and a hell. There's people who don't believe that. There's people who believe that there's a heaven, but there's no hell. And I'm telling you, they need to be convinced that if there's a heaven, then there is a hell. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. Seven through ten. This is a time that false teachers, and maybe you've been told this. Maybe you've been told that it's too late, that Jesus has already came back. The end of the world has already come. It's too late. There are those that teach uh, that uh, the rapture is coming, and when it comes, some will be taken, some won't. When they're taken, nobody will ever know it. They'll just disappear. Well, that's not found nowhere in the Bible. Maybe you've been taught that. Well, I want you to know what the Bible says about it so you can make an educated decision of how you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ and obey Him. In uh, 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1, there were those people going around saying that uh, Jesus already come back. And it's too late. In verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, the apostle said, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on, on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, separation from God, spiritual death, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, which are you and I, the church, the kingdom of God, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. 
Maybe you've been taught something that's not in the Word of God. And it's been taught to you that it's something that God said, something Jesus said. It's religious. Well, this morning, if I can be of any help through what we're studying on, maybe help you see that maybe you need to change your mind on that and quit listening to those who are teaching you. And start over again. And let someone take you through the Word of God and let God teach you through His Word what He wants you to do. Wouldn't that be better? Yes, it would be better. For those that obey not the gospel, know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, those who are not Christians, those who have never repented of their, ba- their sins and have been baptized to have their sins washed away, are not Christians. They're not children of God. You have to repent of your sins and be baptized before you can become a Christian, a child of God. Because that's God's way of washing your sins away. It's in baptism. He'll wash them away as far as east to the west and you'll never remember them again. He'll wipe the slate clean. I'm telling you, that's good news. I don't know about you, but I don't look, like to look back to my former life before I become a Christian. It's not a pretty picture at all. Guess what? I don't have to. See, I'm out, of the, I'm out from under the power of guilt of what I used to be. I don't have to look back there anymore. Because Jesus has washed my sins away in his blood when I was baptized. That's what the Bible teaches. But God's going to take vengeance. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. He's going to take vengeance. That's right, he's going to pay you back. He's going to destroy you. He's going to allow you to go to a place called hell and burn for eternity where Satan and his angels are. And you'll never get out of there. You'll always be in torment. That's what he's going to do. In the end, when you die or Jesus comes back, and you never have repented of your sins, been baptized, had those sins washed away, God will take vengeance on you. Because he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. He allowed Jesus to die that horrible death. Jesus was buried in a tomb. He rose again on the third day, never to die again by the power of God. He has made all that possible so that you can make an educated decision and decide to do what he says and go to heaven. If you reject that, my friend, I'm telling you, God will take vengeance on you in flame and fire. There is no excuse for a person not to know God and obey the gospel of God. That's what it says. It didn't say just know Him, but obey the gospel. That's what it says. You have to obey the gospel before you can go to heaven. You have to repent of your sins, be baptized before you can have your sins washed away and go to heaven. Romans chapter 2. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I believe it's time for people of the world and even in the church today to quit arguing and fussing about who's doing what and who's not doing what. Quit arguing and fussing about who's wrong and who's right. In the physical eye, in, your, in, the eyes that, in our eyes, we categorize sin. We might look at others and say they're worse than we are. But in the eyes of our Lord, because of sin in our life, we're no different from the murderer. We're no different from the thief, the adulterer, the homosexual, and etc., etc., etc. Because of sin. That's where God looks at sin. Sin is sin in the eyes of the Lord. And sin will separate us from God no matter what sin it is. 
if we're in it. But in Romans chapter 2, starting with verse 1, Paul said, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, <clears throat> whosoever art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same thing. Now, preacher, I'm not a murderer. I didn't go out and murder like that guy did. I'm not a drunkard. I don't go out and get drunk like that person did. I'm not a doctor. I didn't go out on my mate like that person did. Yeah, but if you do sin, even if it's just one, it's the same thing in the eyes of the Lord. Sin is sin, and sin will separate you from God. So think about the sin in your life. And then next time you want to judge somebody about the sin in their life, that ought to cause us to shut our mouths, all of us. Whether it's in the world or in the church, there, we should quit making the big fuss of who's right and who's wrong and let God do it. <clears throat> Verse 2, Be, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you think that if I uh, say something about that other person's sins, that he's going to hell, and I'm, not going to, and I'm going to escape hell? No, my friend. We both have to do the same thing that God says in order to have those sins washed away. You see, I can't look at those people in the government and all the sins that they have because the sin in my life, okay? The sin in my life. I do the same thing when you look through the eyes of God. Sin is sin. And so there, if I judge them, I'm ju condemning myself. Jesus said, or God says, vengeance is mine. Vengeance belongeth unto me. He will do the judging. And how does he judge? Through his word. He judges through his word. All 66 books of the Bible he judges man with. He goes on to say in verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We need to repent. We need to... Uh, <clears throat> Let God and His Word do the job He intended it to do. Every person that's lost, it don't matter who they are, they will never be saved unless it's through God's Word. Unless it's through God's Word, the knowledge of God's Word. And you and I as the church, it's our responsibility to tell people about God's Word. Tell them about Jesus and God's Word. It's then and only then will they have the opportunity to be saved. From going to hell. I'm glad I had that opportunity, or I would be going to hell. In verse 5, but after the hardness and impotent heart, treasure up thy, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The only reason that I might not do what God wants me to do is because of the hardness of my heart. The only reason people don't come to Jesus, even after hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, is because of the hardness of their heart. And what happens, all in a nutshell, we save up, whether we're Christian or not, we save up wrath in the day of the wrath of God and His righteous judgment for ourselves. In verse 6, Who will render to every man, you can put woman there, according to, to his deeds. All that wrath that he's been talking about, he will render to every man according to his deeds. That which you have done in the body, whether it be good or bad, be rendered unto us. If we have disobeyed the gospel and we uh, <clears throat> reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and we live like the world, we live like the devil... Well, he's going to render us according to those works. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
But if we have repented and obeyed the gospel and are living unto God, He'll render, render unto us according to our deeds. And we'll hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter to the joys of thy Lord. He will render unto every man according to his deeds. <clears throat> Revelation 20. The Apostle John was given the privilege of seeing a revelation. Give to Jesus Christ. And he makes it known unto the world and the church. Revelation 20, starting with uh, verse 11. <clears throat> John said, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, when it says the dead, that means those who are not Christians, those who have not been baptized into Jesus Christ, both small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. The books is all six, six books of the Bible that you hold in your hand. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, or the Lamb's book of life. And the dead... Those who have never obeyed the gospel and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Not the book, the Lamb's Book of Life, but the books according to their works. What they did in the body, whether it be good or bad, they were judged out of the books of the Bible, not according to what you and I think or what president think or some king thinks or what some doctor thinks but what the 66 of the books of the Bible say is what they're going to be judged by according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell deliver up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works you see when we stand before Jesus one day I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that we're going to be reminded of the works that we did while we're here on this earth. And that's how he's going to judge us. Do our works compare to the 66 books of the Bible? You see, that's how we're going to be judged. And we can look at our life today. If you're not a Christian, you can look at your life today and you can come to understand whether you are obeying God or not, whether your works are for the devil or for God. Revelation 21, 1 through 8. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely, whosoever will. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burnt with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. My friends, God's given every man and woman the opportunity 
today while it's still today. God in his own mind will decide when Jesus comes back. When God sets Jesus in motion, he'll come back from being seated at his right hand and he'll come back in the clouds of heaven and he'll remain in the air with all the mighty angels and, and he will send down the angels and they'll go to all four corners of the earth and they will seek out those who have repented of their sins and have been baptized, had their sins washed away and received the gift of the Holy Spirit and those who have lived faithfully to that until they have taken their last breath and have died in the Lord and was buried and they will rise up first. And those of us that have been faithful unto death that are still alive and remain will be caught up together with them to be with the Lord forevermore. Friend, God's given you the opportunity this morning to make an educated decision where you want to live after you die it's your choice you decide where you go if you're not a Christian the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God by believing that message one repents of their sins repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and you turn towards God the Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have their sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not to help you speak in tongues like some teach or do miracles like some teach, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning and God's speaking to you through His Word and the Holy Spirit and you know that you're not living just the way God wants you to, it's because of sin, my friend. Sin is the only thing that will put us in that condition. Sin is the only thing that will separate us from God. And you need to repent. The Christian doesn't have to be baptized again. They just need to repent. Repentance is changing and turning from that sin and turning back to God. 1 John 1, 9, God made provision for the, the one who is a Christian. It says... If we will confess our sins, speaking of the Christian, he is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me. In his home.